that's different. Isn't it? Okay, yeah, you see, you guys, anybody want to buy one? Because sin's believing, you know, I would like to look. Because something I might say might be different. Oh, I know it'd be very different. Everything would be very different. I want to read some from this book. This book was written, I believe, in 1920. 17 or 19? 1920. 1920, this book. It's called God Man Made Flesh by Dr. Carey. Dr. George Carey traveled all over the world. And uh, he's got several books. God Man Made Flesh. It's definitely worth your, your time and money to purchase it and read it. I wonder why they chose that photo for that book. Uh, I have no idea. It, it, it's a it's a reprint. It's not the it's not the original. The original didn't have anything on it. It was very made very simple. Ever who the ever who gets the this material and reprints it, put all different kinds of front covers. It has nothing to do with the book. But I've seen I've seen people with this book green, a yellow, with nothing on. It. So. So it, that cover, don't let that cover throw you, just the title, God, man, the word made flesh. And that is, you know, just the title of it is a tremendous revelation or a lot of work in it. And so, you know, the things that uh, I want to share with you out of this, I just want to read you a couple of things that he wrote uh, from this book. And, uh, you know, a prerequisite to really to get from where you are is to open our mind because if we keep the same mind that we've always had, we'll stay where we've always been. I mean, you know, that's, everybody kind of knows it. So how do you get from where you are to where you want to be? Number one, you have to open your mind and start to think different. If you don't think different, you can't, you can't be different. So open your mind and thinking different. That's hard, especially when you're talking to, quote, religious folks. They can't think different. They're blocked in or locked down by their ideologies, and you've got, to, you've got to consider that those ideas have been around for 1,700 years and have kept us blocked. But a lot of the things that we could think or we could see, we, it requires getting out of that box. And, you know, that's why I like that little phrase I have up there. I don't know where it's at, so I don't there. Don't uh, put my little... <coughs> A little plaque up there. Oh, I see why it's not up there. The back come off of it. It says, don't think outside the box. Think like there is no box. I didn't realize that. Before. That thing fell off the back and broke. Anyway, let me read you this. There is no salvation or regeneration for man as long as he believes in vicarious atonement. And boy, that's, that'll make a mad woman. <laughs> that'll make a mad. Now you have to think about that and I wanna, I'll say some things and I realize that people get upset about it. I'm not trying to get anybody upset. I really want us to think because again, you can't get from where you are to where you'd really like to be is unless there, you start to do some introspection. Introspection requires thinking different. Unless we can think different about who I am, if I can't think different about myself, it's hard for me to move from where I am to where I'd like to be. So to get to there, there has to be some, some... So I'll read that again. I want to say that again. I realize that's a tough statement. Right? That's just right in the beginning of this book, you know. And, and you have to think, and I'll, I'll say this, Jesus never taught vi vicarious atonement. You won't find that. He didn't do that. As a matter of fact, you will find that the majority of the things that Jesus taught in the four Gospels are not taught in the Christian church. Define vicarious atonement. Blood sacrifice. Outside self sacrifice. That's why I was looking at you explaining a second. Blood sacrifice. Something, a sacrifice of an animal or something outside yourself that can save yourself. I see, I don't, whoa, yeah. that's difficult. Isn't it? Now let me read a little further. There is no salvation. He has quotes with the word salvation. Because the word salvation 
is so grossly misused in the Christian community. Sad to say, it's grossly misused. Actually, the word just simply means to be whole or complete as who you are. And the struggle that most people face throughout life is the division that's in their own heart. It's not because of necessarily religion. It's because they're divided among themselves. You can unite yourself to yourself. That's your higher self, the S. In other words, your God self to your human self. And you realize they are one so that you are visibly, physically God manifest in the physical body. If you can see yourself and think of yourself like that, you can change yourself. But if you have to take something outside yourself to do that, then you will never accomplish it. That's what he's saying. I realize it's hard, isn't it? I know it's hard. There is no salvation or regeneration of man. Regeneration. A lot of words here that I, I want you to think with me about. And I'm going to show you out of Genesis, the very first eight verses. Regeneration. Restoration. Resurrection. All of those words basically mean the same thing. And one of the ways that you can say that, it simply means to come up. Or to, if you think of resurrection, you think of to raise up. If you think of regeneration, you think of being anew. These are all things that has to do with coming up. So, listen to this. There is no salvation or regeneration for man as long as he believes in vicarious atonement. The man who needs saving by that process is not worth the price. <laughs> Hard <of> words. <laughs> Hello. Whoa. Recognition of eternal unity will save man. When you recognize you are eternally connected to the source. Save means to be whole. It hadn't got anything to do with the burning hell as we have been, been taught. Hadn't got anything to do with it. Saved comes from the Greek word sozo and actually means to be complete, to be whole. The ideology behind that is you are, but you don't know you are. You've got to connect the dots inside yourself. Recognition of eternal unity will save man from the idea that he needs to be saved. <laughs> because it will reconcile him to his place and mission in the plan. And, and what I, I say, you have, to, you have to really think about that. <laughs> All right. Only the spiritually blind look for the coming of truth or life or the Christ who is ever present or for the coming of a kingdom which is already at hand. If you don't, and what did Jesus say? Why do you go looking for it? That's what Jesus said. Luke 17, what are you looking for? Why are you going here or there or down young? He said, why are you going to Israel? Are you looking for the kingdom of God? He said, it's inside you. Well, if the kingdom's inside you, salvation's inside you. If salvation and the kingdom's inside you, God's inside you. So you already have everything that you need. So what are you looking for? So maybe you can kind of think about that. Only the spiritually blind look for the coming of truth or life or the Christ who is ever present or for the coming of a kingdom which is already at hand. When you pray for a thing, know that you have the thing. Isn't that good? Yeah. If you're praying for something, if you're asking God for it, and I, you know, I remember last week I told you this guy from out west called me and said, I don't even know how to pray now. That's good. I said, that's wonderful. I said, you all, all your prayers mostly are directed at something outside you. Yeah, well, I mean, you're trying to get in touch with something that's outside you. If you can realize that that thing that's outside you is inside you. So if you'll direct your prayers within your being and 
you realize that you already have the very thing that you're trying to get. Well, I mean, <laughs> isn't that what was on That's the what the ten men said. That's it right there. Exactly what I was looking for. said, you're going looking for something that you already got. That's the beauty of, the, of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I mean, that is a mythological fairy tale. Fairy tale that's telling profound truth. Wow. You can carry that right over to the Bible and the Scriptures and realize they are phenomenal stories, or in other words, fairy tales, that contain deep, deep truth. And so we can see that. Wow, it can begin to help us and to change it. Let me read something else here. This is a touch of what he talks about in this book. He says, So much for the old world belief that the scriptures or the writings in the Bible are records of men and women and places geographically, historically, and so forth. These wonderful statements are fables, parables, allegories, dealing with the chemical, physiological, anatomical, and astrological operation of the human body. Wow. Uh, that, that, to me, that really resonates for me because I, I can see that. I, there was a time I couldn't see that. There was a time I was spiritually blind thinking that I was saying the things that were the truth, but they weren't. They were just religious garbage. And when we look at this, that, and if you will, take your Bible and turn in your Bible to Psalms 139. And I want to read this passage to you. Psalms 139. We're going to read some more from Dr. Carey maybe next week. Psalms 139. Oh, let's see. Where do I want to start here? Verse 7. Psalms 139, verse 7 says, Whether shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Now I want you to hear this. So where can I go? From your spirit, or where? How can I flee from your presence? And the those are questions. The answer is, there's not anywhere you can go, and there's not anywhere you can flee to. That God's spirit, God's presence, is not there. That, that's the answer. That, those are questions. He he said, if verse eight. He said, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. But if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Notice, notice how it's, if I make my bed in hell, hell just simply is the Hebrew word sheol, which means to live as a dead person in the grave. That's, it's not a place to go to. That's how people live. A lot of people live that way, as, as though they were dead. He said, if I take the wings of them, huh? And not awake. Yeah, and not awake. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. You see, he's not—he's saying, nowhere I can be, nowhere I can go, that you're not present there, and that you're not there to lead me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light. L I G. Even the night shall be light about me. Did you hear that? Even the night, the dark, will become light. That's going to be, you'll have, you'll have to think about that because that'll be important here in a few minutes. You'll see it. Yea, the darkness hides not from you, but the night shines as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. That's going to be important in a few minutes. You'll see that. To God, there's no difference. You understand? And I'm, I hate to use the word God, but I don't have any other word that I can use that I know of that I can use that I can really communicate from a religious perspective into a knowing perspective. So sometimes we want to use the word essence or energy or power or source 
or all of those different words, and they all refer to God. But to say God, many times, just the word, when you express the word, many times people will see an old man. They automatically go see an old gray-headed man. And that's the, if I would like to take that out of our thinking. And it's hard because that's how we think. And so when we talk about the Elohim as in Genesis chapter 1, that's the Hebrew word that's translated for the word God. But Elohim means many powers or many facets of energy. Because when you look at the Elohim, you have to look at the sun as it moves. Every, every two hours it moves into a different facet of its energy. And that's how you get the 12 angels of ancient mythology, or the archons, which are actually the angles that the sun is coming to the earth. In each two hour increments, that sun is doing, even at, at night, it's what he's saying, even at night, it's still light. Okay. Everybody on the page with me? He said, he said, even, verse, verse 10, I'm at verse 10 on Psalms 139, verse 10, even there shall your hand lead me, and your right hand will hold me. I will say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light of, about me. Yea, the darkness hides not from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness as the light are both alike to you. For, for you have possessed my range. You have covered me in my mother's womb. Now this gets really good, so just listen closely. I, I can't break all this down into Hebrew, but I would like to. I'll try to break some of it down a little bit and uh, let you understand what we're talking about. But you can hear it a lot, even in this, in this translation of the language. Verse 13 says, For you have possessed my reins. Reins can also be called your kidneys. And we'll talk some about that so you can understand what they're referring to because the Bible gets into all of the organs of your physical body, but it uses different language. When it talks about the couple Sarah, Abram, Sarah, Abram, it, that's the same thing as saying Sarah, Brum. So if you can understand that, you're Sarah, Brum, or you're Sarah, Abraham, is referring to your upper brain. So if you can understand that, you begin to see that all of these characters, just like Dr. Carey said, all of these characters are allegories in a phenomenal story, and that phenomenal story is about the temple or the tabernacle or the sanctuary or the house God built to live in, which is you, which is your physical body. And we recognize that. We realize my body is, as Paul said, the temple of the living God. My body is. So does that mean it's my body if I don't smoke or if I don't drink or if I don't chew or if I don't run with those that do? <laughs> No, it ain't got nothing to do with that. It ain't got nothing to do with what you do or don't do, what you did or didn't do. It hadn't got anything to do with any of that. You think God would leave us because we did something God didn't like? I mean, you know, how would you like for somebody that's supposed to be one of your best buddies to bail out on you when things get tight? Or when you're doing something they don't agree with? They ain't your best buddy. Come on, I mean, you know, we have, we have belittled God to be so manlike and belittle ourselves and pull ourselves deep in the pit. God's raising us up. It says, For you have possessed my reins, you have covered me in my mother's womb. Now I want you to we'll talk some more about the covering in the mother's womb. How did God cover you in your mother's womb? Well, one of the ways He did was He took two major organs you have in your body, your physical body, the tree of knowledge which deals with the right and left hemisphere of your brain that's called the tree of knowledge this is where you get to know things right knowledge comes by by understanding by reading by searching by digging it's it's, the, it's up here it has to do with your brain so the tree of knowledge of what they told you in religion of good and evil actually dealt with right and left hemispheres of your brain those are the hebrew words ra and tov ra and tov right and left. 
So rather, and you can say you're good and evil. Well, it's sort of like that old guy years and years ago. Some of y'all won't remember, it's too young. Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson said, it's this little guy over here on my shoulder. The devil. It's the devil. <laughs> it's the devil that did it. You remember? Well, who do you want to blame? Well, it's my husband, my wife, or no, it's the devil. It's the devil that did all that. So really we've got an, an escape goat called the devil. Blame the devil for everything, bless God. <laughs> it ain't me, it's the devil. So, <laughs> But what happens is you have to re recognize it, realize this, the greatest organ that you have in your physical body is the skin on the outside of your physical body, which is directly linked to your brain. So actually it's called, your skin is called a mem brain because your skin is your brain. So your physical brain up here that you see up here, you can't see it, but your skin, all over your physical body is your brain and it's your skin that's giving you the, the phenomenal perception of feel. I feel that. And you can feel it, right? And that's why you cover me, what? With my membrane, which is my, my brain on the outside. It's not the, the one on the inside, the one on the outside. The one on the inside connected to the one on the outside in every kind of dimension. So it's the largest organ in your body, okay? So he says, you cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that includes I don't care who you are. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows that right well. My soul already knows that. We're going to talk some more about that in just a few minutes. My soul knows all this. Your soul already knows everything I'm trying to say. And if you pay attention, there are a lot of things that I might say that your soul will recognize and say, yes, I already knew that. Because I won't say anything that you don't already know, but many of the things we've forgotten are pushed to the side. And when it's said, you have a recollection or you have a remembering. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus said, I'll bring all things, the Spirit will bring all things back to your remembrance. Well, you had to know it and forgot it to remember it. Right? Yeah. And so to remember means to reconnect to it. That's what remember, reconnect to that. I already have, I already know that. Why? My soul is a depository of it. You see, your soul has more information than the Britannica, all the complete Britannica encyclopedia. Your soul has more information than your computer. That's a lot. Because if you don't know anything, ask Google. So really, if you want to know anything, ask your soul. Because it has the depository of it. And we're going to look at the soul probably different than most people look at the soul. We have to grasp it from what the Scripture says about it. And all of the words connecting to it because if I tell you, if I were to sh tell you that connected directly to your soul is the serpent of Genesis chapter 3, is the Nafael of Genesis chapter 6, in other words, the giants. So if I told you that your soul was connected to the giants and was connected to the snake, you would flip out. But I can show you from Scripture that that's exactly where you're linked. And it's not what religion has told you that it is. Far more than that. It's greater than that. Verse 15 of Psalms 149 says, My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now what that passage says in Hebrew and what it says in English is hard to jamble it up. Well, what, what, it's all kind of messed up. If you had an opportunity to look in the Amplified translation, the Amplified says it clearer. Or if you had an opportunity to look at the Living Bible, it says it a little bit clearer also. Let me read it to you from the Amplified. I just have it wrote here, and I'll just read it the way the Amplified. It said, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed, when I was being curiously built, are wrought as though you were embroidering a seven-colored blanket. You have to 
hear that word, seven colored. So what is he saying? He's saying that I was curiously knitting you together just like I would knit a blanket of the rainbow colors, seven colors. So what was he saying? He said, I was knitting you together in the womb. You all have heard this phrase, God's building us a house without the sound of a hammer and without the saw. And everybody told you in religion, it's out under somewhere. That's not true. You are the house that was built without the sound of a hammer and a saw. You were built in your mother's womb, and God did it. God's the one who built you there. And God built you out of the colors of the rainbow just as, a, just as an example of light as it reflects through a prism. And that light reflects through a prism gives you those seven colors, those seven basic building blocks, those seven sounds, seven vibrations. And then we'll see that. Now, I'm hoping you're thinking. So if you will go with me to Genesis chapter 1 and... This will be very different. Now, after you have the uh, drawings, the architectural drawings, the blueprints, the plans, the patterns of a building, that's one of the first things that you want. You come on. Are you coming? Yes, good. You're coming. Bump the heat up, uh, somebody there, right there between them. Yeah, because those refrigerators put heat up there, and I think it. You're reaching oh, over there. Yeah. 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 So, bump it up there for you. Yeah, I just moved. <laughs> okay, after you have all of these plans, blueprints, building pattern, and all of that, one of the first things that you do on a building site is you clear the building site and then you start digging, right? So if you're going to go up, before you can go up, you do what? You go down. You have to build down. So the first thing in the building system is to go down. And I want to, uh, I want to put this up here. God's not out there. I'm not saying that at all. 
I'm just simply saying the God that's out there is in here too. So he's not separate from me. He's always in me. He's always one with me. Now this, uh, this all, all mythologies are hung on this. this I'm going to use this and call it the uh, uh, a Passover. This baby that's in the wood. That's you and your mama's belly. It's your head. These are your shoulders. Here's your lungs. Your heart right in here. Your, your intestinal area. Your pelvic. Your gonads. Your legs. Your feet. Now, all ancient astrologies, mythologies, are built on this story, this ideology, so that you can understand how that all of the all of the uh, signs that are hung in here, for instance, if we hang this sign here and we call this one Aquarius, we call this one Taurus, Gemini, Taurus, Aquarius. Aquarius is the realm, right? The, and the realm referring to the 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 two upper part of your brain as the ram, the a ram, the ram up here. So you have the Aquarius, you have Taurus. Taurus is the bull. The Old Testament says that the children of Israel were stiff-necked and bull-headed. Bull-headed simply refers to your lower brain, your ser your serah bullum, bullum. Bullheaded. That's just where most people, this is where your see, smell, taste, touch here. This is where your sensual brain is back here. This is where most of us live and stay stuck in our sensual apparatus. And then you have Gemini, the twins. Can you see how you can just move right on around? You have Leo, the lion hearted. You have Virgo, the womb. Everybody's got one. You have Libra, which is called the scales of justice. The scales of justice. Simply because it's your pelvic connected to your spinal column going up to your brain. You see that? It's not, it should not be scales of justice. It should be scales of balance. Because when we think of justice, we think I did something wrong. Now I read, I need, now what I need is I need judgment. I need to be but really all you need is balance. You just got out of balance. Have anybody ever got out of balance? Many times what happens if you get out of balance? Don't you fall? <coughs> Sometimes in a fall you can hurt. Sometimes you can break something. It's not wrong. It's not right. It, it, it happens, right? Does it happen? <laughs> it ever happened to you? It happens to me a lot. So if we would come back and we would begin to look at this in the proper fashion that the way it's designed, the way the picture tells us, the picture, the story, the allegory, in other words, this book, this book is the picture of the allegory or the story of you. This is an old, old story that goes back beyond any religion or any concept, no matter what the religion concept. This story goes beyond that. So that's a picture of you. And, and that's a picture of the astrological movement of the sun, the moon, and the stars that create you. That's why every one of you are unique and different based off your birth chart. The time, everything about it makes you who you are. The very moment you were built, it characterized you. It, it made you unique and beautiful and different. Okay. Genesis chapter 1 is about this starting here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this. I'm going to put uh, dark. And I'm going to put this light. 
or I'm going to call line, I'm going to call it above, above, and I'm going to call it dark, I'm going to call it below. Okay? So that we'll, we'll connect the dots above and below. I want you to understand this. So the first place that we're going to start, let's just look at Genesis and see what it says. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning, in the beginning, that's, that's one, that is one Hebrew, basically what's called word. It's not a word, it's actually a succession of Hebrew glyphs. In the beginning is the Hebrew word, Barashit. Beth, Grash, Alif, Shin, Tol. That's how it's spelled. It's five glyphs. Beth, Beth means house, container. Grash means fire. Alif is number one. That's source energy. Sheen is spirit. And Tov is the very last glyph in this 22 glyph, letters of the Hebrew glyph. And actually it's the end or the ability to stand. So in that particular word, it's translated in the beginning, could have and probably would have been more accurate if they had just said at your birthing. Because the way you can associate that is at your birthing, when mama pushed you out of the garden, delivered you from her, she said, oh hell, something's got to give here. <laughs> the birth pains was telling her that. Right, you ladies? Mm -hmm. Something's got to go. And it got to be you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I ain't putting up this no more. And so you got pushed out into the real world, <laughs> into the world you're in right now. And so all of that is, is in here, and it's all in that word, bottom sheet. At your birthing was your beginning in this incarnation. In car. Car is just flesh. That's all it means. It's when spirit moved back into flesh. God moved back into this dimension in you, through you, as you. Wow. Okay? So that's what that word said that in the beginning. That's what that Hebrew word, God, Elohim, that's the many powers of that movement right here, that movement as it moves in those increments. Okay? The many powers and its movement created by Ra. That means it brought forth a child. That's what that word in Hebrew means, bara. It's translated in many ways, cut down. It comes from bar ah. Alif means child of God. Doesn't mean man or son of God. It doesn't mean woman or girl of God. It means child of God incorporates everybody. Male and female. Not one above the other. <coughs> Not one better than the other. <coughs> Both equally the same. <coughs> Created that's the child, heaven and earth. Heaven. <coughs> That's two glyphs. Sheen, Mim, which actually, this, this glyph right here, it means water. The two most important things you're going to begin to see right here, and you'll see this in biology, it's beginning to come out all over the place in biology, is what creates anything in the physical dimension is water and light. Water and light. That's what you're going to start to see. Water and light. <coughs> you are a water vessel. You know, used to they'd say you're 80% water. But now they say you're 95 and 99% water because they finally realize that your water, your lint node, makes up 70%, 75% of the water that's in your physical body. And then the blood that flows within your body makes up another 25%. The blood that flows in your water in your body is like salt water. <coughs> the water that flows in your lymph nodes is like fresh water. And they don't mix. They don't. Fresh water flows into salt water. Pulled up and just turned back into fresh water. But you look at the earth, they don't mix. They don't mix in your physical body. They're separate. This is the water's above. <coughs> And then the second part of this glyph, this is the Hebrew word for heaven. The second part is Yod Phanomim. 
And this is water below. This is salt water. This is rain water. Now what happens, let's read this. Let's go on further. Let's just go a little bit further. Verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness, darkness. Everybody say darkness. Darkness. Darkness, darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. So what we begin to see, we start now to start with waters. So if you understand heaven, the word heaven is not talking about a place you go to. It's talking about waters, a combination of waters. That glimpse, anybody can do that. It's not hard to break this word down out of the Hebrew and see. Shem, Mem, Yod, Mem is the four characters that make up this word heaven. And it's real simple to look at it and see that it's referring to waters above and waters below. And that's what he's talking about here. And now the first thing that's beginning to happen is spirits moving on the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. Now what do we have introduced into the equation? It's the Hebrew word or. Or. And that Hebrew word, alif, wav, resh. Alif, wav, resh. That word is used for two other words grossly misused. It's used for the word curse. And it's used for the word arat. Ararat. A R. A R A R A T. Ararat. It's used for two words, grossly misused. If I say curse, if I said curse, immediately you think of something negative and bad. If I said Ararat, immediately you're going to think of a mountain where you have been told through religion that a boat got hung there. And there's a boat stuck up in that mountain somewhere. Both words are totally wrong because if I were to spell the Hebrew word for light, or, and I spelled these two words, you would say, whoa, that looks like light against light. And that's exactly what it is. So if I understood the word curse, I could realize that it's light from without and light from within. What is the light from without? Same thing as the rainwaters above and the rainwaters below, or the waters below. The light from without and the light from within. But what's happened to the light from without and the light from within? They, they create a contrast. They create a struggle. It's not wrong. It's something that it creates a friction. Your heart wouldn't beat if you didn't have that tension or that pull. I mean, that's, that's how you live. That causes life. The map, the, uh, uh, this word is the same thing. It's light, light with the toll, the top, time on the end of it. That's what that word tov has to do. Lice glyph in the Hebrew. Has to do with time, the element of time. So what happens? Now you have light that's against light in the element of time. So when you understand the word Ararat and look at the story, you will realize that the light from out and the light from within has struggled and brought you to a place in time that you can start again. And if you look at the story, the way the fairy tale is told that's exactly what happened to Noah when he landed there. What did he do? He started again. So if you realize the story is telling something more profound than the story is talking about something that's happening in me. The light in me is struggling from the light outside of me the way I'm seeing things and it brings me to a place that I can start fresh. Well I'll tell you that's right now. If we understand it, we realize it, there ain't no other time than right now. Brings me to that place where I can begin again now. Start fresh. So, he says, God, verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and He called the darkness night, and the evening and the evening, notice when it starts. It starts here. It starts. It starts even. Even. This is when it starts. If you'd think when it would start up here, this is where most of we we most think we're starting up here. You don't, you start right here. You start at your gonads, your pelvic your balance, your ability to walk. That's where you start, right here. 
That's how this starts and opens up. It begins to open up the building of the physical body. It's built from here up. When we look at the Eastern ide ideologies and the Eastern ideology about Kundalini, y'all ever heard that? Y'all are familiar with that? Kundalini? Kundalini is a word that means energy points. That's what it means. It means cross sections of energy. If we truly broke the Greek word church down, it's ecclesia, it would basically mean the same thing as condolini. We've been told the church is this building where we come to to worship, to meet. It's not true. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when it's talking about the church, it's talking the same as the condolini energy. Or it's talking the same as the seven colored garment you're made of. Or it's talking the same as the seven colors of the rainbow. It means the place is the energy. When you shine light through a crystal, through a prism, it reflects. It has cross points that sends the energy into a different color. So you realize right now what's happening. The light passing through the crystal of water is beginning to create in the evening. And then goes around. What's it doing? It's, it's building my foundation first. If I'm constantly trying to build the top of the building, if I'm trying to build the roof and come down, I saw, I'm reading a book by a scientist, a biologist who is about water and uh, is about the different biological aspects of water, but he has a picture in the very front of this book. It's just, a, I think it's the most profound picture I've ever seen. It's this guy, he's on the bottom, or he's standing on the ground <clears throat> on two balls. So, so he's not stable. But he's holding up this huge building. And on the very top of this building, yeah, it goes up four or five stories, you know. It looks really beautiful in the middle. And then on the top, he's got this, looks like this another guy is up here building this solid brick wall on the top. And here's this guy in the bottom, you know, standing on rubber balls, unstable. I tell you, that's exactly how most of us have built by the ideologies we've been given, especially through religion. That's why we're so unstable. Our foundation has to be laid right. The energy comes from the, the lower section up. It's not coming down. It's coming from, when you build a building, you start at the foundation. Here's the foundation. The foundation is right here. The foundation is the scales of justice. The foundation, it, that's your gonads. Beginning to build that, that's where the condolini rises. So when you talk about Eastern Richard, they talk about a condolini. They don't ever talk about condolini coming down. <laughs> they talk about the condolini coming up. It rises from the lower, lower extremity up into the upper extremities. It rises up here and it begins to like you and like you. So let's read on. And God, verse 3, and God said, Let there be light. There was light in the evening. He saw the light it was good and divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The first day. Uh, if I, I said day, hmm, if I said day, I'm not talking about this part, this upper part. I'm not talking about this lower part. I'm talking about all of this part. And this word day is the Hebrew word yom. And actually it means the facets of life. So I begin to realize now the first day of this building block deals with my balance, my pelvic, the, the foundation of my being is referring to the whole dark and light. It's not referring to just part of it, it's referring to the whole thing, the above and the below, the rainwater and the salt water. Did you see how this would all come about to build you and to make you and to cause you to be who you are, cause you to be the uh, very thing that God designed. Now go with me. I'm going to close right here with this passage of Scripture. 
Chronicles. Go with me to uh, First Chronicles. I'll just close with this passage. Because there's just so much here. I realize that so much of this is different. Uh, every bit of this information is deposited in your soul. And your soul knows all this thing. Your soul does know this. That's what he said over his song. Your soul knows this right well. All of this information is deposited in there. It's just unscrambling it or whatever. First Chronicles chapter 6 verse 10. It says, And Johanna begat Azariah. Johanna, that just simply means mercy. It's the same as the word for John, the the John the Apostle in the New Testament, his name John just simply meant mercy or grace. That's what gives us life. It's the love, the mercy, the grace of God. So this is starting that Johanna begat Azariah, and Azariah just simply means the strength, the strength of spiritual quality. Spiritual quality has great strength. So he said, grace begets strength. That's what he said. He it is that executes the priest's office in the temple. The word temple is the Hebrew word Beth. That's what is it's this glyph right here. Beth, which is number two, and it just simply means container. Our building. Building. So when he said the temple right here, he's using the Hebrew word Beth, Bait. He's not talking about something that was built over in the Middle East that was called the Temple of Solomon because notice what he says. <coughs> he executes the priest's office in the temple that Solomon built. Solomon Solomon, soul. What is soul in Chinese? I mean, in uh, Spanish. Son. Son. Soul is son. It is. O. Man. Man. The son in man. What is the son in man? It's the light. And so who said, what he's saying right here is that he's saying the grace which executes strength and he's saying spiritual quality and ability. This is what's building the temple of God. What is that? It's the sun that's moving every day. It's out there. It's life in you. If it wasn't there, you would not, we wouldn't even be here. <laughs> we'd be on Mars, wouldn't we? Or we'd, be, we'd be somewhere else from one of those other places out there, Saturn or whichever, wherever, whatever. We'd be in one of those places. If we can get begin to grasp just, you know, just like Dr. Carey nailed it right there at the beginning, if we could begin to grasp that I have no need to look for salvation, I am salvation. I have it inside me. My ability to be whole is in me. I don't have to go outside myself to find it. I don't have to go outside myself to look for it. It's inside me. I know that's offensive, especially to the Christian here. But my goodness, if we can just see that and realize how marvelous, how wonderful, how beautiful that we are individually and collectively, we would, we would uh, not only are we going to change the world, we would definitely change our own self, our own life. We would be empowered to do that. And that's the first place you got to change. Where's the first one? It's, it's got to be <clears throat> Where, It starts here. <laughs> it's not him or her or them or they. That's the Michael Jackson song, Man in the Mirror. There's only, you want to change the world? Yeah. Change this guy. Yeah. All right. So hey. now that you have spoke with all that. I'm going to sing that song again so everybody can get a better meaning of the song because it was a lot and a lot to do with what you were talking about up here. Mm, good, good. Whoa. 
something else that's makes you do it. I have to be, but, but ultimately, I pay the price for it. And so what I do in that, in that ideology, I have to have somebody else to carry my weight. Why? I don't have enough responsibility or strength to do it myself. And so what have I done? I have weakened myself. 